to pay. Work to exhibit. And so that's that's kind of the, the, the one shortcoming that I see with it. You, we need to broaden it, not just to say that this is what a virtuous woman looks like. But she'd say this is what a virtuous person looks like. These are qualities that we should work to implement. So we're going to go through the passages of Scripture. I think that we've got four of them today. There's one on page 101, one on page 102, one on page 105, 103, 105, and then finally I think 106. So any other comments about the lesson before we start reading it? All right. Well, Deb, would you like to read the first passage for us? Yes. Minister, no husband. Who can find a wife of noble character? She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will not back anything good. She rewards him with good, not evil, all the days of her life. Okay. Now, as an exercise, let's just take and... I'm not trying to change the Word of God. But instead of saying, who can find a wife, let's change it to say, who can find a person? Yeah, these are qualities of a of a wife, but these are also qualities, like I said, that we as people should begin to exhibit. Who can find a person of noble character? Okay, so please explain to me what noble character looks like. And that's what the whole lesson is going to be looking at. What is noble character really like? The first thing is, is that the person that has noble character is more precious than jewels. Any of y'all have jewels? Rings, necklaces, earrings. Do you uh, keep those things at home in your junk drawer? No. Um, do, do you do you do you wear them when you're out there working in the garden and digging in the dirt? You, you have. But for the most part, what what do you think? My why do you think that I'm mentioning this? You take care of. You take good care of. It's it's precious to you. It means something. So this this is what we need to do if we're going to be noble. We need to learn to appreciate what we've got. <laughs> I didn't. Too slow. Yeah. Yeah. If I was a turtle, like... <laughs> I'm just kidding. Poor turtle, he doesn't even get a break when he's not here, does he? Nope. Okay. Um, let me ask you a question then. Do we ever treat people disrespectfully? I have. And if we do treat people disrespectfully, how, in what ways do we treat them disrespectfully? As many you can do it verbally. Verbally? You can do it with your actions. Actions? Welcome. Welcome. So the first thing that is on this list of things that we need to do if we're going to become honorable, noble, the first thing we need to do is evaluate how much do we really appreciate those people within our lives and are we demonstrating it by the things that we say, by the things that we do. Um, one of the things that I know has great women for, for years, and understandably so, they work hard, and I know that I may be showing my age, but many times they work very hard keeping the houses up, because I'm looking for some backing here. The guys, for the most part, aren't the best housekeepers in the world. Was that a faint, a very faint <laughs> amen that I heard? For the most part, the guys are not cooking the meals. They're not doing the clothes. They're not cleaning the floors. Oh, when we first got married, he cooked all the meals. I didn't cook. When you first got married, 50 years ago, 50 years ago. Yeah. I mopped my floor at midnight last night. 
Oh, well, of course, you're living on your own. You're living on your own. But I'm just asking, and I'm, I'm using this about husbands toward their wives, because that's what the book is talking about. But are there those things within our lives that we do that dishonor? The wives many times have complained about feeling unappreciated. Yeah. They work hard all day long trying to get things straightened up, tidied up, whatnot. Somebody walks in the house, five minutes time, they can undo what it took all day to get right. What did you just do when you did that? You did not treat that person like a precious jewel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For those on the camera didn't see it, Chuck just whispered over in his wife's ear, I'm sorry. As if, I'm sorry covers a multitude of sins. You know? Also, I've heard about wives that work hard, you know, try to get a meal ready for a certain time, and then somebody doesn't show up at that time. I had a question or insight. It's not really on the subject, I don't believe. But late last night, uh, I live in an apartment complex, and I don't know my neighbors that well. I just moved in. I've been there two weeks now. And I did hear some history about a girl that was staying in the apartment I was in. I just got in a fight with her boyfriend and stuff like that, and then she had a protection order against him. And then I was told, just from the landlord told me all this, he said, he said I thought you would wait for the apartment to open up. She moved into moving downstairs with another gentleman, and then last night she beating on my door, pounding, wanting, screaming help. But I heard him arguing for hours out there, and I could hear the argument. And I'm thinking, this is madness, you know. And when he came knocked on my door to pound him, I wouldn't answer. And I'm in the middle of the same time I'm teaching my daughter. I, I, I've seen an opportunity to teach my daughter something about when to get involved, when not to get involved with people. Certain people, because it could cost you your life, it could cost you a lot. Like I said, I, if I spoke with you, I grew up in some dangerous areas. So I learned sometimes you don't get involved with people because it could cost you everything. You know, you, you, sometimes even when you get involved, you find out they become, they're okay later, but you're the bad guy, you know? And I, I put my daughter on FaceTime and was talking to her with, with, while I was in an argument, and then I heard her knock on the door, and I said, baby, I said, look, I said, I want to answer the door. But I'm not going to. I said because I believe from what I know about people and I've met through people and judging character, I says this lady's causing problems and she's looking to cause more problems. And I said this is where we don't get involved in it, trying to tell her this could cost your life. I don't. It was a conflict in my morals because I want to help someone, mm -hmm. but I also know by helping it could have caused me a lot of grief and havoc. And like I said, it, Eventually, it could cost, my, cost me my life. You never know what it could cost me. Cops ended up showing up, but what, what my door there? was full of blood on the outside. Didn't, I didn't know that part of it. There was blood on it. I kind of find out um, she had done it to herself by punching a couple windows out. I didn't know this, but I didn't know if that would make me right or wrong. I now. don't think that this lesson is talking about her. <laughs> no, 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 I was, at, I was wondering okay. if I was right or wrong in that situation. What city are you in? I'm close to Wintersville. I'm in Steubenville. I'm like uh, off Riker. Stay away. <laughs> <laughs> you know, can I, I wasn't going to bring this up, but maybe that's the tactic the devil's using on us this week. Because Thursday, I got called by the senior center. They wanted me to go up and check on a woman, and I said, I've not been on her call list for over a year. I want to take it off of it, and they said, you're the only name we have on her emergency call list. And the driver was there trying to deliver a meal and couldn't get a response. So I went out, ended up calling the police, they came in. A really long, complicated situation, and the exact same thing. The woman was doing stuff that she should not have been doing. She didn't fall. She just wasn't even there. She, but she was in the fault because she was not what she was doing. She wasn't following the doctor's orders of what he had told her to do, like drive and that, you know, that kind of stuff. So maybe that's the tactic, the devil. Because I've been wondering about it since Thursday. 
Because I, I said, don't ever call me again on that again, because I don't want on that list for her. Um, so maybe that's the tactic the devil's going to try on us this week, uh, getting us to feel guilty like should have we gotten involved when we, common sense says, been there, done that, don't want to be involved again. I don't see any problem with the way that you handled it. I think that that was wise. And again, that's what these whole lessons from Proverbs are about, is to teach us wisdom. And I think that in this day and age, there does need to be on our part a, a cautious this, especially if you're talking in the middle of the night, you know, with somebody that there's been conflict going on outside and they're pounding on your door and whatnot. The police did show up, so I don't see any problem. Now, if there would have been a situation where two people were out there and it looked like that one of them was going to get killed, you know, you may have to go out and intervene or something like that, but I don't see any conflict with what you ended up doing. See, that's why I wonder, because I'm a fearless person. I don't have, a, you know, I, there's a lot of stuff that I will go and handle and not worry about. I, people, don't, people don't scare me. I fear God, but I don't fear people for no reason. There's no need for it. I don't, there's no need to have live in fear in your life. It's, that's not God put us, I don't believe that's why God put us here, is not to live in fear, no. I believe we're supposed to live in happiness and, and enjoy everything He's given us, but I just wanted to make sure I was giving my daughter the right tools. Yeah. That's what's most important. You may have to pull out a nail gun and say, I'll shoot you, and buddy, I'll nail you. <laughs> There's too many people having guns now, especially over in that city. Well, I've watched, growing up, I've watched people get killed in front of me. I've watched people get shoot, shot in the head. I've seen some bad stuff, you know, so um, I just, I don't, I've become really soft with my kids. <laughs> and, and I just want to make sure that, I know I can't protect them all the time <clears throat> and shelter them, and I have to let go. But as a parent, that's like the hardest thing. It's like my kid getting a paper cut. It's like the end of the world. You know? Well, yeah, I don't see any problem with the way that you handled it. And again, this is all dealing with wisdom. Right. With today's lesson on finding a virtuous person, I just, again, want to repeat the first thing that I want to bring out this passage is that the first thing that we could do to establish noble character is to learn to value people. And I think that a lot of times when you get into marriages that have gone bad, there is disrespect on one person toward the other. Sometimes it's, it's mutual. When, when I say disrespect, um, when you value somebody, you take care of that person. Just like it talks about jewelry. You, you take care that you don't want to do things that are going to make that that thing less valuable, or that could damage it. Um, I was talking with my mom yesterday about a, a situation where a person continues to do things even though the person that they're doing it to has repeatedly said it bothers them. You know, I, I'll just use this as an illustration. If you're married, and your wife has mentioned to you before about, don't throw your clothes on the floor. Carry a man too. And you continue to do it. You're doing the things that are showing that you don't value your wife. Because if you did, I mean, use this as an illustration. If the President of the United States told you don't do it, well, the president told me to do it. I'm not, I'm not going to do it. I have respect for the president, but I don't have respect for my wife. <clears throat> you see what I'm saying? This thing of treating people that like they're not valued goes to whether or not you're really trying to do the things that honor that person. And I know that I'm using stereotypical examples about the... And it could be a, a husband, too, that does it going out and buying his toys. But if you go out there and you spend the, the, the family's finances without really checking with the other person, and then you throw the, the finances of the family into a bad situation, you've just disrespected the other person because you said, basically, I'm going to do what I want. I don't care what you want. And so I just want to say, to find a person of noble character, the noble character, first of all, recognizes that relationships, people, are valuable. And you try to do the things that treat that person as valuable. Mm -hmm. 
And the more valuable that something is, the more respect you treat it with. I, I, I showed you the video, or I've told you about the video before. This was a movie uh, video series that came out back in the 1980s, Hidden Keys to Loving Relationships. It was done by Dr. Gary Smalling. And um, he ended up having some high-profile people that watched the video series and benefited from it. John Tesh and Connie Selica. Some of y'all remember their names from back in the 80s, 90s. Uh, also, Frank and Kathy Lee Gifford, they ended up watching him. One of the videos, because I watched the entire set, one of the videos, he takes an old violin that he picks up, and the bridge, I guess it's the bridge, of the, the violin is pulled loose from the main part, and it's just dangling by its strings. And he just kind of picks it up casually, nonchalantly, and nobody really pays much attention to it. And then he says, you know, it really doesn't look like much because the thing is kind of weathered. It's lost a lot of its finish. And then he says, when I look inside of it, it's got a name. What do you think the name inside of it was? Stradivarius. Stradivarius. And as soon as he reads the name, you hear within this group of people, I don't know, there's probably 50, 60 people sitting in a classroom type setting in church. You hear an audible gasp. <gasps> All of a sudden, this thing that people thought was a piece of junk that he picked up at an auction somewhere, when they hear the word Stradivarius, for those of you who don't know, those things are worth millions of dollars. All of a sudden, man, oh man. And so he says, I'm going to casually let you look at it. And you should have seen the way that people kind of treated that. You talk about handling something with kid gloves. And... So this is what the writer is saying, that if you want to develop noble character, first of all, work on treating people like precious jewels. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're married, note the things that your spouse really appreciates. And do those things. But also note the things that your spouse doesn't like and make sure you stay away from those things. You are trying to encourage a stronger relationship. You're not trying to weaken the relationship. A second thing I want you to look at, verse 11. If you're going to find somebody of noble character, you need to be completely trustworthy. The heart of her husband trusts in her. You know why I feel like that most marriages go bad? People say, well, it's because they stopped loving each other. Nobody invests. Nobody invests? Yeah, and I guess you could go down that road. But what was that? They break their trust. They break their trust. Yeah. How do you break trust? It isn't just by cheating on somebody. What's that? Not being understanding. Not being understanding. I mean, when you when you talk with somebody, you want to know that they're, they're with you, that they're understanding, that they, they care about you. And so, you've got to work at building trust. How long does it take to undermine trust? Not very long. Just one little thing. I'll use as an illustration. Some of y'all have been around dogs. You ever seen a friendly, happy dog? Mm -hmm. That dog just comes out there and wants to jump over and wagging his tail, licking you and everything else. If he nips you one time. Does your attitude toward the dog change? Yeah. <laughs> what happened? The trust. the trust got broken. And that's one of the things, again, with valuing a person in a relationship. All that it takes, it could be an unkind word. It could be saying something behind their back. It could be turning a deaf ear to them when they really needed you to listen. You've got to work on building trust to be the sort of person that the person will gladly open up to you. Everybody is looking in life for somebody that they can connect with. You know the one thing, I shouldn't say the one thing, but this is one of the big things that makes the Lord so precious to all of us. Is that we found as we go through life, we can trust Him. He always understands He's always willing to forgive. He's always willing to listen. 
He's always trying to encourage us. He's always trying to build us up. And so this is what we're trying to do, is to build this level of trust within our relationships with people. You know, you and I need to be straight up and forth, forthcoming with folks. If, if your spouse ever finds out, you know, there's been stuff going on, all of a sudden the mistrust rises. And as soon as the mistrust rises, you lose that noble character. All right? If you trust in the person, you're trying to do things that are good for them. Um, I know that those that Clyde and Janet had married 50 years, Chuck and Miss Bessie was going to be 46? 48. Y'all are in the lower 48. <laughs> you still have a Y in Alaska to go, right? Um, but your spouse is somebody that you know really does care about you. How do you know that the person cares about you? Because they're trying to do good things for you. And as we go through this lesson further in the sermon, you're going to find a list of some of the things. And we may want to supplement with some of the things from our own experiences. They really mean a lot to the person. This woman of noble character, she's always trying to do good. That's verse 12. She rewards me with good, not evil. I am not going to try to get back at this person. You know, if we go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it's the great love chapter. What is one of the things that stands out to you from that? Love is patient. Love is kind. What's that? Yeah. Gentle. Here's one part that sticks out here. Keeps no record patient. of wrongs. Patient. Keep no record. Well, you and I should never do wrong to a person that we really care about. So that'd be unconditional, basically. We're trying to do good. And even the Apostle Paul, I think it's over in, I can't remember if it's in Romans, in Romans like chapter 15 or 16, or over First Thessalonians chapter 5, where he talks about, don't ever repay somebody evil for evil. But instead, overcome evil with good. Try to do good. And this is going to be, we're going to be going through lists as we go through the rest of this lesson. A list of some of the good things that this woman has done. Our lives need to be built upon good things. We have spent time in the first part of, this, of our study of Proverbs talking about, don't be like those that sit around and plot evil all the time. Don't go down that road. If you're going to spend your time, figure out things that you can do that's going to be good for each other. I know that one of the things that stands out in my mind with Clyde and Janet is that they're all the time planning the family get-togethers to do something special for somebody. Whether it's a birthday. I know that they said that they weren't going to be here this evening because of graduation. They're going to go celebrate Amanda and Vince's graduation since, you know, the schools around here didn't, didn't do that. But you're trying to do something that's going to make that person feel good. I know that Miss Bessie would try to make sure when Chuck got off of work that there was something to eat, something that he liked. I like everything. You like everything. <laughs> he even likes liver and onions. So that pretty much... <laughs> but you're trying to do good things. So let's take a look. At some of the good things that this lady did. We're going to go over to page 103 to the next passage of scripture. Who would like to read that? Becky, would you like to read that one out loud, please? Sure. Okay. She selects woolen flax and works with willing hands. She is like the merchant ships bringing her food from far away. She rises while it is still night and provides food for her household and portions for her female servants. She evaluates a field and buys it. She plants a vineyard with her earnings. Okay, hey, hey, hey. she's some woman. Some woman. <laughs> she's some woman. That is some woman. All right, here's what I'm going to say as we go through the rest of this lesson. Um, this lady is not lazy. 
This lady is not lazy. Here's where I want to go further with it. And I'm, I'm getting at something. I feel like that we're living within a society that has really become lazy. What are some of the things that people do with laziness in their lazy time? There is a, if you want to develop noble character, you, and I'm, I'm going to make this point before we go any further with the lesson, you won't become a person of noble character by being idle. I know that Becky made this comment to me last week. She said that uh, years ago she got rid of the television in her house. How many years ago? Oh, probably 20, maybe more, I don't even remember. I've had them given to me. I don't want them. Ask them on somebody. Why? Else. Why? Because it's a waste of time. <laughs> don't tell the advertisers that. <laughs> <laughs> you know the only good commercial. Of course, I have you know internet and I have laptops and tablets and all kinds of stuff. The only good commercials I ever see anymore <laughs> are the ones advertising the flea collars. There's a really cute one with dogs out on a campfire talking about their flea collars. No. See, I'm the only thing that's any good. No. Hi, Tony Sue. Good to see you. You're welcome to come in and join us. Um, yeah, and, and I'm just I'm just saying with regard to it, please, as we go through the rest of this lesson, notice that this lady does not put a high value on her being entertained. I'm going to use a, a word that oftentimes I would use along with entertainment. Amusement. We have amusement parks. But they're places that people go for family entertainment. Is, isn't personal happiness the key to projecting happiness too? It is. It is. Uh, we do want to be happy. But I'm just saying that as, if you're going to work on building noble character, I feel like, and I know that I'm biased at this point, I feel like that we're living in a society that is as lazy as it's ever been. And I know that people spend an inordinate amount of time watching television, on computers, playing with smartphones, and I'm just going to say, of course, they didn't have those things back at the time that this was written. But this woman, she's a super human woman. I mean, when it talks about she goes and selects wool and flax, the uh, teacher's book, do y'all know much about flax? I don't even know what it is. Well, it's a plant. Here's what it says. Fibers from the flax stem were used to make linen. Stalks of flax were pulled and laid out to dry. The seeds were removed and then the stalks were soaked in water for three to four weeks. You soak the stalks in water for three to four, not hours, not days, three to four weeks to loosen the fibers. After another round of drying, workers used a type of comb to separate the fibers from the inner core of the stem. Those fibers then could be spun into thread for weaving fabric. Now, we're accustomed within our society to go down to Joanne Fabric and get a yard material. What they're saying about this woman, they didn't have cloth stores back then. She would end up having to go out there and select flax in order to go through this process in order to get the fibers from the flax so that she could spin those together into thread so that she could take the threads and put a bunch of threads together in order to make cloth. Ooh, sounds like more work than I want to go through. 
That's what I'm saying is that as you go through this, a person of noble character isn't afraid to work. What do you think she went through with regard to the wool? Any of y'all ever seen it? And of course, I don't know what they had back in those days, but I think back to the early American years, they had those spinning wheel in which they would take the wool and they would basically spin it into wool thread so that you could take the threads and put a bunch of the wool threads together to make wool cloth. That's work. I'm not going to get involved in it. <laughs> our, our friend who lives in Germany, her and uh, they live in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and we still communicate. And my person, she, she is something else. I mean, she does everything. She got a spinning wheel, and she she's been spinning the wool from the start. And I'm not encouraging us to go that route. I mean, if a person decides to do it, I have, I have at my house, it was from the former church that I was at, a lady in the church down there, Ruth Hendricks, uh, she ended up having a loom within her house. And she, I don't know, I guess it's proper to say knit, she made me a scarf. She, she did it on the loom. And I don't know how many, because I went over there, and you've got to take this shuttle, I think is what they call it, and, and you, you run it through various threads, and then you make one line across this way, and once you get it through that way, then you got to shoot the thing back through this way. It takes forever to make a section of cloth just this wide. I, I have no idea how. But I'm just saying that we live within a society that ends up saying, you know what, I, I just want to sit back and see what's on television. Name Valley has those. A lady, actually, she sat us down and she was letting us do that last year okay. when we were out there at the barn. It's a big barn. She has okay. a big barn and she does it. And I forget, I don't want to take, but she sells dish towels and stuff that she makes. You yeah. pay a pretty penny for oh, it because oh, there's a yeah, lot of time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Miss Bessie nice. knows from doing those quilting. Quilts take a huge amount of time to go over those stitches all around it. Yeah. I mean, anything. And I'm just saying, the person of noble character ends up understanding. I started to say about amusement parks and entertainment, because I use these interchangeably. I remember Dr. Adrian Rogers saying, what does the word amuse mean? It is a, it's a compound word of a prefix, ah, the a means not. Muse means to think. Amuse means to not think. When you go to an amusement park, it's so that you won't think. It's just about having fun. And the writer of Proverbs has said all along through here, look folks, if you really want to be wise, remember Solomon is writing to his son, now this is written from King Lemuel, they say, look, if you want to be wise, you're going to have to understand, you can't go through life on an adrenaline high and just being, having fun all your life. You're going to have to work. There is a great deal of satisfaction that comes through accomplishment. A big satisfaction. Big satisfaction that you can't get from being amused. Amusement is a dime a dozen. Accomplishment is very rare. You've got to work at it. And when you finally get it. And so I'm just saying, as you go through this list, you find this woman, she's even thinking about the wool and the flax that she wants to select in order to make wool cloth and to make linen. And she works with willing hands. It doesn't mean that she gets up every morning and says, uh, why in the world do I have to go through this? I hate this. Look at what it's doing to my hands. You know? She works well. She understands if I want something in life, it ain't going to be given to me. I got to work at it. It says she is like the merchant ships bringing her food from far away. And far away doesn't mean going down to the freezer in the basement, <laughs> it means that she goes to the store. And, of course, back in those days, they didn't have a store that sold everything. 
you would go, and this is the way it is in a lot of third world countries, most every one of them. You go from one little market to another little market to another little market, and you've got to gather up all the things that you need in order to take it home and prepare a meal. I'm just telling you as, you, as you go through this, this woman, this woman works. I don't know when she ever sleep. It says in verse 15, she rises while it's still night. I think about every year when, whenever we're doing Christmas dinner or Thanksgiving dinner or Easter dinner, my mom, and probably your mom did too, she'd get up at all during the night to make sure that the turkey is getting done right, make sure that the ham is being done right, Put together the ingredients, put a meal together. It's one of those things that work, work, work. So this is a key to building noble character. You've got to be known as a worker. And let me just encourage you at this point. Have you ever sat down and done a time analysis of how you are spending your time? How much of your time is spent being productive? How much of your time is spent just being entertained? Amused. I just want to feel good. This woman understands, look, I need to be busy doing something. It's going to make me feel good. It's going to make my family feel good. It says she provides rice and while still night, provides food not only for a household, but also portions for her female servants. She cares about everybody. You know, noble character means that you don't just think about your family. I think about the people as I've gone through life, that they care about others, the people that have reached out to me and done nice things for me. It says also in the 16th verse, she even evaluates a field and she buys it. What she got in mind? Well, she takes her earnings... And she plants a vineyard. I think I figured out a way in order I can make more money. I get amused on, um, you folks know that one of my favorite programs of all time is Leave it to Beaver. How many of those episodes deal with Beaver, Cleaver, and his older brother Wally trying to figure out ways that they can make money? Here's the thing about it though, and we're a lot like them. We want a quick return. This woman, she would end up going and buying a field, and then she'd plant a vineyard. How quick was her return? How long does it take for a vineyard to become productive? <coughs> years, years, years. But I'm thinking ahead, I'm thinking down the road. You know, I'm going to throw this out there. This past year, I, I saved on a couple of, and it's not just been this year, but it was also last year. They said that the average American doesn't have $1,000 in their bank in case there is some sort of emergency. I'm, I'm talking like 50% of Americans. What does that mean? Here's my point. People are not doing anything to prepare for the future. This woman thought ahead. And I'm going to just throw, that, throw it out there to you. You and I need to prepare ahead. I know Jesus ends up saying, take no thought for tomorrow. Don't take it out of context. I don't believe that, I don't believe that Jesus was saying, you know, you just need to live hand to mouth every day. Is that what you really think that Jesus believes? No. No, in fact, when I, I read the story about the feeding of the 5,000, after the 5,000 people ate, he sent the disciples to go out and gather up the leftovers. How many leftovers did they gather up after the... 12 baskets. 12 baskets. Is there any significance in that? Yeah, but Take it one step further, please. You may say, I don't know what step. How many apostles were there? Guys, we have enough to eat tomorrow based on what's left over. You know, what is that saying? Jesus is thinking ahead. 
I believe that Jesus wants us to think ahead. And this woman, she's, she's thinking ahead for her family. You know, a lot of times people end up coming and saying, well, I don't have such and such. Did you do anything in preparation? And this woman is somebody that gave serious thought to what's coming down the road. She plants a vineyard from their earnings. I can take what I have, I can use it, turn some money. I'm not going to get it back tomorrow. I may not get it back next year. I may not get it back the next year or the next year. But I'm going to plant this vineyard and down the road, I'm going to reap the benefit. Is it going to mean that I'm going to have to keep up with this vineyard the whole time? Yeah, it is. But it will pay off in time. You see, my point is that we tend to be very short-sighted. And a person of narrow, of noble character looks ahead. And they plan again. They don't wait until the crisis comes upon them and says, oh, now I'm in need. No, you try to plan ahead. I know that our time is growing short. Look on page 105. Who'd like to read that one? Anybody want to volunteer to read that one? Passage of Scripture. Betty, would you like to? Thank you. Is it sure you are her reputation? Betty? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Her husband is known at the city gates, where he sits among the elders of the land. He makes and sells linen garments. She delivers belts to the merchants. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she can laugh at the time to come. Her mouth speaks wisdom, and loving instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the activities of her household and is never idle. She has to watch the TV. <laughs> And let me say, you and I do benefit from recreation. You know, all work and no play. Thanks, Jack or John, a dog boy. Yes, Mary. Does she have time to get tired and take a nap? It's not high on her list of priorities. She is trying to be noble. What does it mean to be noble? It means that you and I don't want to be like everybody else. And, and, and I used this illustration here sometime back in our Sons of Class. Nobility, I think, refers to, in the days of the medieval knights and whatnot, royalty. It means that you just didn't want to be like, not to be politically incorrect, but you didn't want to be a commoner. You wanted to do something to elevate yourself. To make sure that you just weren't like everybody else. You can be like everybody else just by doing what everybody else does. She wasn't doing it just to be different. She was doing it because she understood it would be of help to her, her husband, her family, and those around her. And so what did she She, she gets a reputation. Her husband is known at the gates where he sits among the elders. But there's respect there. She takes and she makes and sells linen garments, it said in the teacher's book. That was probably like undergarments. You remember that when Jesus was crucified on the cross, they did not want to cut up the undergarment that he had because it was woven in one piece from top to bottom. They said, oh, that thing's valuable. We don't want to tear that thing up. So they basically cast lots for it to see who could end up getting it. Those, those were prized things. And this woman, she's apparently taken linen, she's taken wool, whatever. And she's made garments. The belts, you know, they were probably ornamental type belts. And it says, strength and honor are her clothing. Clothing is what people see when they look at us. And when people looked at this woman, they saw somebody that, as it talks about in the 27th verse, they didn't see somebody who was idle. They just kind of sat around all day. They saw a woman that was strong. They saw somebody that was um, honorable. Somebody that was worthy of respect. And how did she get it? She got it from saying, you know what? I don't want to just sit around. I want to do something with my life. The last passage of Scripture. What's going to be the result? Of it. Sheila, would you like to read it? Sure. Thank you. <clears throat> her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also praises her. Many women have done noble deeds, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord will be praised. Give her the reward of her labor 
and let her works praise her at the city gates. So it says that the result is that her children are going to rise up and call her blessed. Uh, over the book of Leviticus, there's a passage of scripture that says that we should rise in the presence of elders. Were y'all aware of that? Let me find it. Um, Leviticus 19.32. But it says that these people, you know, when a judge enters the courtroom, all rise. It is a way of showing respect. When at the beginning, at the beginning of the ball game, when they played the Star Spangled Banner, why? Out of respect. Bessie's brother-in-law passed away in Georgia a few years ago. He was a military person. The grave was over two hours away by car. And every time we would drive, we had a big long caravan. Everybody that was coming the other way would pull off the road. In respect. And it probably didn't hurt any that you were over the center line when they pulled up. <laughs> Just <laughs> But I've I, I seen it here, but not like it was that day. I was really impressed last week because I went down to Parkersburg for my buddy's wife's funeral. All the way, and there was a procession of probably 40 cars, but we went through Belfry and Parkersburg. People kept pulling over out of respect. But again, it's a way of honoring. And it says, this is what's going to happen when you work to become this sort of person. You know, you may be sitting here saying, I don't want to work. Let me tell you something. I don't know that anybody necessarily really wants to work because it's so fun. I know that Eric over here doing the roofing stuff. There's a lot of jobs out there that a person could choose to do with their career. I don't I think that roofing would very be very high on mine. I used to be an engineer. Engineer. An electronics engineer. And I, I'm more passionate about this than. I'm just saying with all these roofs. Climbing up on there and having your ankles twisted all the time and carrying that stuff and baking under the hot sun. But at the same time, I just want to say to you, this is the way that you build noble character. Is a willingness to work. And it says that you're going to be praised for it. The most important thing is not, as it says in verse 30, most important thing isn't being a charming person. Oh, isn't that person just charming? The way that they can just talk. Talk is cheap. Right? It's not about looking pretty. You can look pretty. What really helps to make a person great is a person that fears the Lord. You see, we do what we do is because we feel like it's what God wants us to do. Do you really think, and I'm going to close by saying this, do you really think that when you get to heaven, and I say you, I'm not saying it about any of you, but I'm using that an illustration, the person that just wants to sit around and be entertained all day. You think that that's the way God wants you to stand before his throne and say, and what did you do with your life? Oh, Lord, I had a great time. I sat there on my television, and I just watched television all day long. It was wonderful. I, I didn't do anything. What do you think God's going to say? <laughs> you laugh, but I'm afraid that that could be true. Because God has given us an opportunity to do something. I've got a plaque. I told you I was going to close the other. But I've got a plaque at my house that was given to me when I left Plum Creek Baptist Church back in 1989. A family there in the church, uh, Wes and Loretta Reynolds, ended up giving to me with their daughter, Ronnie Sue. And it, it ends up saying, What you are is God's gift to you. What you become is your gift to God. And this woman was somebody that ended up saying, You know what? I want to become an honorable person in God's eyes. And I pray that we will take that to heart. That we'll live every day realizing that God has put us here in order that we might honor Him.
Let's have a closing prayer. Father, we thank you for reminding us today of what noble character is all about. We pray, Father, that you might help us to work on being noble. Not, we don't want to become uppity. We don't want to become snobbish when I talk about nobility. But, Father, so many times it's easy to just do what comes easiest. It may become easy just to end up sitting around or taking it easy or not cherishing people around us. But pray, Father, that you might use the lesson to inspire us to work on becoming noble, people that are honorable, people that are a real credit to you. And pray, Father, that people might come to know you because of the way that we live. We thank you for the lesson and pray that you'll use it within our lives, that we might ultimately become like your son, Jesus Christ, who is the most noble, honorable person that's ever lived. Use us, Father, for his glory. Bless now the service to Father. Teach us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.